Welcome to Money Matters. My name is Malcolm Sibe. Now, coming up on the show, the impact of the shilling appreciation, the real estate sector, agricultural chemicals, and the danger to agricultural products, consumers, plus the pivotal role of the auditing function to business. Capital is a major challenge afflicting many businesses. But while many look to financial institutions like banks to meet this challenge, private equity and partnerships are another avenue that can be utilized for the same. Innovation Norway offers a matchmaking platform where East African businesses can be connected with Norwegian entities interested in their sectors. Jens Clausen is the director, Innovation Norway. Give us an idea, just a brief digest on what Innovation Norway does and uh, why should, uh, for instance, a businessman in Uganda care that actually Innovation Norway mm -hmm. is around? Mm -hmm. yes. Maybe to just give you a small background, um, Innovation Norway is the Norwegian Government Trade and Investment Promotion Agency. Uh, their main target group is actually the Norwegian businesses in Norway. But of course, for a small country like Norway, to grow their businesses, they have to look at the international market. Um, the East African community consists of countries which has been uh, enjoying several years of growth. So we look at the East African community countries as emerging markets. Now, if you look back, Norway has had a 50 year of aid history with Uganda. So maybe Norway is more known as a donor providing financial and technical assistance to Uganda. And we represent an entity which is now taking a new look at Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda, Burundi, where we're saying, well, time has come to look more at regular economic cooperation through trade, investment, but also research cooperation. That's quite a good agenda you have for East Africa. Let's look at East African businesses. Are they ready for this kind of engagement? Are they ready for business? To put it this way, I mean, our approach is that we try to research the market here. And the way we do that is to link up with the business associations, but also government uh, authorities and agencies who are in the same uh, mandate as us to try to promote business development here. Okay. Because the market for us is the, the Ugandan sorry, business community here, who are seeking technology and knowledge, which we do know that we have available in the Norwegian business community in Norway. Those with uh, uh, market orientation for the outside world. So we're trying to link them up, which is the business matchmaking part of it. But we do the sourcing, we bring the specific opportunities to Norway, and that is what is then creating the interest. There are many, many venues which are saying Africa is open for business, Africa is growing. But we have known that now for 10 years. Businesses in Norway are saying, well, we know it, but please give us the concrete opportunity that we can pursue. And that's where we come in and we try to kind of find those concrete business opportunities where we're working with. Now, what are some of the sectors that you're specifically looking at? We're focusing today, uh, and, or for the coming months, on some particular sectors. Uh, renewable energy, which is uh, specifically also on mini hydro, solar, in Kenya specifically geothermal, uh, but also biomass. We are uh, uh, doing some uh, uh, mapping work also on aquaculture and fisheries. And when I say aquaculture, we're talking about the full value chain, cold chain storage uh, distribution. We're also looking at uh, water supply and wastewater treatment. And also interestingly enough, when we then look at these technologies side by side, you can look at, for instance, energy and water treatment as part of a package that you also then propose to the agriculture sector and particularly horticulture, which is where we also have some leads. But there are a number of other sectors that we work on as well, but I'm just mentioning these uh, particular three that we have been focusing on. Uh, I would like to mention a fourth, which I think also Norway is a bit known for, of course, oil and gas. And uh, oil is an uh, evolving extractive industry in Uganda, uh, gas particularly in Tanzania, where you have Statoil, the Norwegian uh, largest oil company, already in operation. Of course, you're looking at things from an area of view, the East African community in totality, the five East African countries. Now, when you look 
at the different players or the different countries that make up the East African community as we know it today. Are they uh, ready to really engage with you? Are they pushing in the direction that you feel is supportive of this agenda? Uh, on a personal level, I, I, uh, many years ago I lived in Tanzania and I was always looking at Kenya as kind of uh, the country where more business and markets, yes. but otherwise more or less the same, like Norway and Sweden. Uh, before we got the oil, Sweden was our big brother. Now we feel we have more muscle. Now living in Kenya, I can see a big challenge and big difference. Not challenge, but big difference. In the business climate, business environment, and how to operate. Then I look at the development within the East African community. From our perspective, that's a very encouraging development. First and foremost, from the level of harmonizing rules, regulations. Yes. Secondly, making it easier to access the markets across the borders. I know there is a, still a way to go, but it took also a long time within the EU, because this is a political issue as well. It's a question of sovereignty. We are not going to, of course, discuss politics in that sense, but we are looking at it, and from our perspective, very encouraging. But if you allow me, yes. there are two dimensions to this uh, uh, East African community development. One, which is important for us, harmonizing procedures. Yeah. So the different countries doesn't individually try to keep, compete itself out yes. by trying to in, attract uh, investors through specific concessions and so on. Mm. But the other part, and that's a challenge, and I attended a meeting here today where I was tempted to say if I closed my eyes it could actually have also been a meeting in Nairobi, where the business community is voicing concerns over certain challenges they face in getting concessions, licenses, and so on and so forth. Uganda's real estate sector is one among many that have been hit hard by the continued appreciation of the dollar against the shilling. Now today we try to enumerate the impact of this on the broader construction sector and how those in it can weather the storm. As the shilling loses more value against the dollar, real estate and the construction industry in general seem to be among the major victims. And today the prices of cement and steel products have moved up by over 10%, with many citing the shilling depreciation as the cause, since some, especially steel items, are imported. Things have not been helped, according to the hardware dealers by the exchange rate set by the taxman to compute tax on such imports. So the challenge is how is government helping us mitigate that that matter because from the source the goods are priced just fine but when you come here it's a different ball game they're going to tell you uh, this adhesive cement is going to cost you 18 dollars they have no price range so government should have a price range where we're working at uh, if you're working at two dollars let it be between two dollars to 3.5 yeah not seven that is triple what I am going to suffer because I'm not going to come to my sh you're not going to come to my shop. I sold you uh, last month I sold you goods worth two dollars and then all of a sudden it's at eighteen dollars. Given the fact that real estate and the construction industry is today one of the most liquid and indeed among the fastest growing sections of the economy, sector experts contend that it is still a viable area. Reality though is that business for those dealing in construction items cannot be done the usual way. You've got to look at your capital requirement and you have to plan that and build in any uh, downsides that will come because the downsides will always be there but you've got to protect yourself so you're either building some reserves that you can use in case the revenues coming in from your investments are not as high as you've anticipated or you diversify. Uh, for instance, we can go into areas like capacity building, which is an area of training, but we can also bid for projects, which will bring in projects, which can bring in some revenue. You can bring in collaboration with other industry players, which will reduce your market overhead. So you share the costs instead of lumping all the costs to yourself as a company. So we look at ourselves as a, a company trying to develop ways where we can engage with the engineering community locally. And for the industry to withstand pressures, partnerships are seen as the only solution. There are emerging areas of uh, infrastructure improvement. All these areas are not going to remain stagnant. They are going to require investment in them. 
And although the shilling is being affected, there are areas that are going to help the shilling. Because if there is investment, this investment is going to attract opportunities of people getting into businesses that were not possible because the infrastructure wasn't there. But because the infrastructure is there, the businesses come in. And when the businesses come in, they also provide employment. And when there's employment, it means people have got money to spend on the services that they need. And this feeds into other areas. So you, you have to look at the two sides. While you have threats, you know, like the shielding being affected, you also have opportunities. Beyond the individual initiatives taken by the business community to cushion themselves against the impact on the operations, the belief is that even more should be done by government. This is because of the trickle-down effect construction has on the wider economy, especially now when trillions have been poured into infrastructure development. It is a common practice today for farmers to apply chemicals in the primary production of both crop and animal products. Trouble though is that some of these chemicals have been proven to be dangerous to human health. Today we look at how deep this problem is and what is being done to control it. Veterinary drug residues in food is a problem we are living with today, sometimes unknowingly. Indeed, on many family shopping lists, meat and poultry are a common feature. However, oftentimes as you go about buying these items, unknown to you is the fact that most big farms, where they originate items, use a lot of chemicals in the primary production process. These animals are normally injected with the various drugs. And these drugs may be remaining in the tissue and therefore the meat we eat. So you don't want to eat things which may be of harm to you. And I'm informed by the experts that uh, if the levels are too much, then this may lead to some of the diseases like cancer that we are getting. You may put to question then the role that meat inspectors play to ensure that the meat you eat is safe for consumption. Meat inspectors do inspect, but you know, once you do inspection, there are so many areas you do a meat inspection. They largely concentrate on the, on the microbiological part of it and not on the chemical part. Now we are looking at the chemical part of it. And it's not just limited to the drugs that are injected in the animals. Some animal diseases can have the same negative effect on humans like they would on the animal if the consumed beef is from an infected animal. Animals which are already sick, for example, with the organisms like TB, you know, we share those organisms, the human beings and animals. So if, if you are going to consume meat of an affected animal, uh, you would be better off if it was irradiated because they would kill those, those organisms. Worse still is the fact that UNBS, the body in charge of ensuring that the meat on the market is up to standard, is unable to carry out thorough checks due to issues of capacity. We don't know the extent of the problem, and that is our worry for all of us. We don't know whether we are actually very safe or we are not, simply because we don't have the expertise, but also we don't have the equipment. So much as meat is a delicacy for many, it should be consumed with some reservation because it may end up causing more harm than good. In Make Money this week, we explore the value of the financial audit function to your business. As an owner of a business, big or small, you may encounter issues of accountability and proper financial management. This is where you may want to bring on board an internal auditor to help out with this function. You need an internal audit function even when you are still a small organization. Because it helps you identify those opportunities. It helps you put in place systems that will help the organization grow. How, how many kilograms of GNATs have I sold? How much transport have I put in? Did I have an expensive lunch such that it can kill the business? It's so important to audit all the businesses. However, many small business owners are hesitant to employ internal auditors because of the notion that they come at a hefty price. But experts say there's a way around this. You don't need to have a full-time internal order. You can have one who comes in once a month, twice a month, if it is a small organization. You can outsource the internal audit function. If you do decide to bring in an internal auditor, you should not just sit back and relax. 
you need to work hand in hand with them. So the internal auditors identify areas for improvement, they report to management, they report to the board. Now, for, for that to succeed, what they identify must be acted on. If they are not acted on, then they are just a paper. Then the value of these great men and women is not realized. But most importantly, internal auditors ensure discipline in the running of a business. It's so important, it's so valuable that small businesses do audit themselves regularly because sometimes because you are the owner of the business and the money, you, you spend the money as you wish, you don't realize how much you are spending. I mean, you always get money from that small business, it covers so many other expenses. But if left to run on its own and auditing it on its own as a business, it can, it can do really a lot of good work, it can run fast. There you have it. Your business does not have to collapse due to misappropriation of funds and fraud. With the help of an internal auditor, this can be detected early and thus save it from going under. The single largest challenge facing agribusiness in Uganda today is believed to be relevant investments within the value chain. Ambrose K is one such person who has since identified this constraint and is investing in processing of wine out of honey as a byproduct. This is his story. Paul's harvest losses in Uganda stands at a record 30% on average across all crops under cultivation. This challenge has been made worse by a weak value chain that barely supports agro-processing. And such is the story of Ambrose Dugari, now proprietor of Rosemark, a wine that is processed out of honey and pineapples from within Kisase suburb of Kampala City. Actually, it dates back to maybe five years when we established the, the fruit farm. We did establish the fruit farm, and then when the fruits uh, matured, I loaded them and pick up, brought them to Kalerwe, I couldn't get the market for the fruits. Then I said, what else can I do to transform these fruits into something that has a longer, a longer shelf life? So that's how we actually we started. This enterprise is one among the few that are balancing the agricultural value chain in the country with a series of actors enhancing their production with assurance of a market. But they are not enough. So we buy from farmers, especially from, uh, from Ruero. Then with Zane, we buy it from uh, farmers in West Nile, specifically, because we use the, the kind of uh, honey that makes good wine is dark in dark color. Eh? But what is the exact processing chain for this increasingly treasured type of honey wine in Uganda's market? We majorly use pineapples or mangoes, but we don't mix them. We use separately. So I have to mark this is pineapple and this is mango, and then we mix with honey. So it's honey, fruits, and yeast. There should be effective safety practices in the winemaking business if one is to keep the loss levels down. So after seven days, we remove the parope, eh? we remove with them the liquid. So here, yeah, the first stage takes seven days. And seven days, we remove everything, we will siphon it, and we come up with a liquid, eh? which goes into the second stage. Ambrose speaks of high levels of creativity as the process advances the final product. So here it lasts for at least one year, and each drum has got details, the date, the batch number, and the ingredients. For instance, like this one was made, this, this batch number 36, made on 1st April 2013. And then now from here, we got the last stage, which is the aging or maturation. On the final bottling of Rosemark honey wine, Ambrose says assessing of the quality should be with ease for any customer. This is hibiscus. Okay. It's called the Rosera hibiscus. This is what you do to turn the wine into, into red. Because they will use only natural ingredients, organic ingredients. So when you put in water, it turns into like red. Eh? kind of bread, eh? then we add into the, into the wine to get the red honey wine. Beyond market shelves, wine shops, Ambrose also sells directly like to customers like with large it. guests such as wedding events. It's now the aging, the final process. So it stays for um, at least a maximum of six months. So there are drums in here, and then after six months, then you go to the parking room. He is now looking at modeling his sales link with customers the South African style around tourism. 
because being near Baha'i Temple, we want to link up this one with dualism. And you see here, actually next week, we're going to construct a room from there up to there. That's strictly a wine testing room. Stay for the art. Where people can come and taste the wine, maybe with cheese, maybe with biscuits, maybe with muchomo. If you want to sit in the wine testing room, you can do that. If you want to sit in the gardens, you can also, you can also do that. So maybe also in the future we anticipate that maybe we are going to leave this place. If someone wants to come here, taste the wine, but also sleep, then they can sleep. And now let's take a look at what's happening in the financial markets. That's it on NTV Money Matters. Thank you for watching. You can text us on 6565. Leave your comments and views. You can also look for NTV Money Matters on Facebook and tell us about the program. Otherwise, I wish you the best for the rest of the viewing.